Um, hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, joint research, which is name is Rapid Chain, and it's a sharding blockchain without sacrificing security. So, I'm going to talk about how we can scalable uh, blockchain. It's a joint work with uh, Madi Zamani from Visa Research and Mariana Rekova from Yale University. Um, so, first, let's uh, start with uh, why we need um, uh, decentralization at all. Uh, and when I presented this slide to my colleagues, they said maybe this is not a good slide because you are trying to motivate Bitcoin. But I'm not trying to motivate a blockchain here yet. I'm just trying to motivate why we are all here. So assume you have a system that you can store data in a place that is safe and live forever. It's going to be a very useful system. But no such a single machine can do that. It is impossible with only one single machine. That is why you need replication. So replication data on multiple machines for resiliency is a very uh, good technique. But then replicas need to agree on the state of the data, and you need agreement. This is the basis for a long time research, which is like uh, the Byzantine agreement consensus or, or the consensus problem. Now, to solve that problem, uh, let's formalize it in more theoretical way. What is the problem really? So you have network of N nodes or N replicas, and T of them are adversarial because if you have a lot of machines, some of them can be corrupted. And then sometimes they call it Byzantine, sometimes they call it adversarial. It means that they are not uh, honest. And then the leader of these machines can broadcast some input then uh, they try to agree on the input, and everybody, all the nodes, should output something, should output Y. So we say agreement if all the honest nodes, all the honest servers have the same state and output the same thing. We say that this is correctness. If the leader is honest, the output should be equal to the input, and otherwise one can be anything. So this is the basic uh, problem that and that talks about the consensus. And there are different ways of solving this problem. Uh, PBFD was one of the ways, um, but there are different ways. Now, what is possible and what is not possible? Can we solve this problem? Is this problem solvable? There are huge uh, research on what is possible and what is not possible. So currently we know that if you are in a uh, asynchronous setting, meaning that if you don't know the delay between the messages and the protocol cannot uh, trust that, okay, if I send a message, I will receive it as exact some delay, then it is only possible if the fraction of corrupted nodes is less than one third. But if you are in a synchronous setting, it is possible if the fraction of nodes is less than one half. Why it is not possible more than one half? Because then the meaning of consensus is not uh, well defined in that setting. So, also, we can think about if you have a public key infrastructure or not have a public key infrastructure. And again, without public key infrastructure, without signature schemes, it's only possible if the fraction is one third. And with public key, you can go up to one half. Now, um, why consensus is related to blockchain? It's a very, uh, it's a fundamental question that I received a lot uh, in my life. So blockchain is actually a, a consensus. Blockchain is a sequence of agreements with total ordering. So the main uh, problem that blockchain is solved is a Byzantine agreement problem and a consensus problem. But blockchains add more to the uh, consensus, to the traditional consensus protocols. One thing that blockchain adds is that in traditional consensus protocols, you usually on the network have a P2P, uh, have a point-to-point -point connection that every machine is connected to every machine. And that's why it's not scalable because like every machine should know everybody. It's not uh, scaling well. But in blockchain, instead of every machine has I'll connect to every machine in a point-to-point -point connected way, they have a sparsely connected network or P2P networks. So it's like it's an underlying networking layer is more sparse for blockchain, which is a good way of scalability. Another thing that blockchain adds to the uh, consensus protocols is the open membership. What open membership means that is that 
the people or servers can join to the network and can leave the network and can churn. And then the blockchain can handle the churns. So these are the um, benefits that uh, the blockchain provides. But at the same time, Bitcoin or traditional blockchains are too much of a good thing. Why they are too much of a good thing? Let's think about it. In Bitcoin, you have 4,000 nodes. And all of the nodes are the replicas of each other. So if you want to gossip a two megabyte block uh, in Bitcoin, uh, it usually took 50 seconds. And so inherently, uh, Bitcoin or traditional blockchains that has, that has a full replication is not uh, scaling well in the term of communication and computation. Because for each message, the message should touch all the nodes in the network. And if the message touch all the nodes in the network, you cannot do better than n squared of communication and computation cost. It's inherently impossible. And so if you add more nodes to the system, you add more latency. And since you cannot have a latency um, the user cannot like have a latency above something, then it's not um, it's not a scalable way. So now let's think about it. So in traditional consensus protocols like PBFD, the replication factor was usually set less than 100 because you need to connect all the nodes together. You need to run a very heavy PBFD among them, so they cannot scale. But in Bitcoin and Ethereum, we set the replication factor to 4,000 nodes and even higher, five, 6,000 nodes. And then there is another problem with these protocols, uh, which I talked about, that now you have to, every message should touch a lot of nodes, which is latency and it's, 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 it's not going to scale. Now, what is the correct number, how much redundancy is really needed in real world? What is the re uh, redundancy that a user needs to make sure that, okay, my, my program, my data is safe and live, but I'm not paying too much for it. I'm not paying for more than what is needed. So this is a trade-off between scalability and decentralization. We want to move toward decentralization. We want to have a lot of replicas, but really what is the a good replication factor. So in sharding-based consensus, we say that instead of having the replication factor of 4,000, maybe you want to let the user to choose the replication factor, or you want more uh, uh, adjustable uh, system. So then instead, you can uh, elect a set of random committees of nodes, and the size of the committee can be different, and each committee runs its own consensus uh, protocol on behalf of uh, the whole network and maintain its own disjoint ledger. So then the number of nodes in the committee is your replication factor, and then you can set it to whatever you want. You can increase it or decrease it. But uh, the good thing about this random selection of committee of the nodes and sharding based consensus is that the throughput can increase linearly with number of nodes because you can maintain the same size of the committee no matter how many uh, are your servers or are your users. So now let's think about what is a good committee size. A good committee size depends on the consensus protocol that you are running inside your committees. So different consensus protocol, as I talked about, can run in different models. Like, for example, asynchronous consensus protocol can run in a model that can only tolerate uh, one third of the uh, faults. So now, I, if I start with the whole set that has one third of adversarial nodes, I cannot sample a random uh, committee or a random subset that also tolerate one, one third. Whenever you do sampling, you, you add some failure probability and error of sampling, and then your fraction of dishonest nodes goes higher. So by checking what is my current set of adversarial nodes and what my uh, consensus protocol can tolerate, I can choose what the committee size should be. So if the committee size depends on uh, what your consensus protocol can uh, really uh, tolerate and what is your uh, guess of the number of failures in your network. So for example, in this um, uh, 
figure that I have. Uh, you can see if I start with one fourth and go to one third, uh, then I need a higher committee sizes uh, comparing to if I start with one third total fraction of adversarial nodes and go to one half, which we choose for rapid chain. So uh, the takeaway lesson is that it's very important to make sure what you want to do and choose your parameters wisely to make sure that you can have a good failure probability of your committee size. So now we talked about committees. We, talk, we told that, uh, okay, it's good. Instead of having all the nodes participate in the consensus protocol, I have only one set. But what this one set is doing, what is the committee is doing? So the sharding means the sharding of computation, storage, and communication. Usually when people start the sharding, they first start with sharding only the computation. What that means is that the, each message touch everybody in the network, but only a committee are uh, like signing the message, or only a committee is responsible to do something with the message. So they see it in the communication, they might store it, because they need it later, but they don't compute on it. Second level of sharding is the sharding of a storage. What that means is that if I receive a message, I look at it. If it's related to my committee, then I store it. If it's not related to my shard or committee, I just don't store it and I don't do the computation on it. So it's a better level because then uh, you also shard the storage and you can have um, um, higher storage as a total, because if you don't shard the storage, the storage is going to blow up very fast with high throughput. And the third level of uh, sharding is the full sharding, which is the, full sh the shard of communication as well. What is the shard of communication means? That it means that when I introduce a message to the network, it shouldn't touch all the nodes in the network. It, it should touch only the committee nodes or a subset of nodes. And then I don't store it, I don't communicate it, and I even don't, you don't send that message as a P2P to the, all the nodes in the network, I just send it to the subset. And this way, I can have a full sharding. So now, we know that sharding is good, but sharding is not easy. It's very, very challenging to, uh, to develop a protocol that works well with sharding. Now, let's talk about what are the challenges. The first challenge is that electing a small committee is not easy because you need randomization to elect a committee and generating randomization in a distributed setting is usually not easy. The second challenge is um, reconfiguration to, uh, to, to avoid the attacks. So what reconfig reconfiguration means? Now, assume I have a shard that, uh, that are well designed, and then I choose my shard, but then the shard is always fixed. So I know that this is my nodes, and I want to use them, but this is a fixed subset. I always use those nodes. Then if I'm an adversary, I can target the shard nodes and corrupt only the shard nodes, and as a result, corrupt the whole network, which is, which is, not, which is a viable attack. Then that is why we should have a periodic reconfiguration of the shard, so the adversary who is uh, trying to target the nodes to, uh, can, are like he he needs time to crop the nodes. But before he really crop the nodes, you uh, you change your setting, you change your shard, you change your nodes, and the, the corruption is not successful. So reconfiguration is a very important part of the sharding, and it's. We should do that. But at the same time, rec reconfiguration is very expensive. Every time you reconfigure, the new nodes should come up, get all the estates, do all the computation, and it's very expensive. So you want to reconfigure, but you don't want to reconfigure too much. So finding a trade-off between what is the best way of reconfiguration is very important. Another challenge for sharding is cross-shard transactions. So now I store my data in different shards, and each shard is doing its own computation. How shards can talk to each other and transact with each other is an interesting question to ask, and the solution is not easy that much. So this, the first challenge is how you can bootstrap the protocol, and I'm going to talk about all these challenges and try to uh, have a solution about it, which we used in rapid chain. So our goal or achievement was that after um, sharding, we can achieve high throughput 
of um, 7,000 transactions per second, which is close to the visa level throughput with low latency of only uh, eight seconds. And it's a sublinear communication per transaction and it's much faster than the previous works. So uh, we tolerate higher resiliency. We tolerate up to uh, one third of um, adversarial nodes. And we have a provable recon reconfiguration based on QCO rule. And it's a decentralized uh, bootstrapping. So, uh, the rapid chain model was that we assumed n nodes, each with a key pair of a public key and secret key, and we assume there are m committees or m shards, and we assume there's a P2P network between all the committees and all the nodes in total. And then uh, we assume a synchronous network with bounded message delay of delta, and which, which the uh, configuration of the delay is very similar to the Bitcoin. So the thread model, we assume the adversary can crop up to one uh, third of the total nodes, and we assume the adversary is uh, slowly adaptive, meaning that if he target one node, it took time until he really cropped it. Now, let's talk about um, uh, the overall uh, overview of the system. So at the first step of the system, we bootstrap the shards, and we bootstrap a reconfiguration committee, and then we do uh, multiple rounds of consensus, then we do the reconfiguration because it's necessary for the system. Each round, each round or, each, or iteration of the consensus is like one block. And, but instead of updating only one shard, which is the, like Bitcoin, we update multiple shards. Each shard is maintained independently of the rest of the network. So the first epoch, we bootstrap a reference committee, which reference committee is responsible for creating the epoch randomness and create a reconfiguration block in every epoch. So it's like, it's the, uh, it has a very high responsibility. But what is the epoch randomness? We use epoch randomness to sample the shard committees to make sure that we have a good sampling. And then each node that joins the system should solve uh, should should use this randomness as well. And we also uh, use this randomness for reorganizing the existing committees. So uh, the rapid chain is closer to the Bitcoin than Ethereum. Uh, so because it's a payment network, it's, it's a payment uh, system. It's not uh, like a full estate uh, um, computation. So it's in a UTXO model, which means that each user sends its transaction to an arbitrary node, then transaction is routed to the output committee of C out. So because if you know the UTXO model, each transaction has multiple inputs and multiple output. Assume we have only one output or the first output is the output committee, then we map the output to one shard. So that shard is responsible to store the output. And that's the only shard that is responsible also to verify the input. If he has the inputs, he can verify them uh, locally. If he doesn't have the input, we need a cross shard verification. To do the cross shard verification, the output committee is responsible to bundle all the transactions that are for different shards and add them together and send these transactions to the uh, input shard, which is which which has the input of the transaction. Then the input shard do the verification of all the transaction and send back a bitmap that says, okay, the first transaction is, has input is correct, the second transaction is not correct. So it's like moving the money between the shards. So we said, okay, do you have? It's like. Assuming two banks, if I have an account in Bank of America, but I have a transaction that's its input is Bank of like Wells Fargo, then I send information to Bank of Wells Fargo, does this guy has enough money in his account? Can you send the money over? And then they send the money over and Bank of America is responsible for doing all this uh, transaction and keeping track that it's verified and add the transaction into its output. So this batch, batch verification helps a lot in the um, throughput of the uh, system. And then we also, because we have multiple shards and shards should talk to each other, we designed an intercommittee routing protocol uh, so that based on Kademlia that the shards can connect to each other and send messages back and forth and then can con con uh, they can send the transactions back and forth. So now, uh, we talked about the overall system. Now, what is the consensus? How we can have the consensus inside the committee? So inside the committee, we looked into the 
uh, committee size of 250 nodes, but still the latency was so much high. It was only 12 seconds, only among this number of nodes, if we have a large block, if, if we have a two megabyte block. So the idea here is that we can first gossip the block without really doing any agreement or consensus, and then just agree on the hash of the block. So um, we, we use the technique which is called information dispersal algorithm. What is this technique? It's a name, <laughs> but I can describe it. It's not that much difficult. So you encode a message. Uh, so you break your message into chunks. So you have a small chunks and then encode it using a erasure encoding mechanism to make sure if you don't receive all the chunks, you can still reconstruct the message. Then you compute, compute a Merkle tree on above the chunks and then give each of your neighbor in a P2P only a fraction of the chunks, not all of them. But because we have redundancy in the chunks for encoding, we have erasure encoding which adds redundancy, then we are sure that we distribute the chunks in a way that we are sure everybody receive enough chunks to reconstruct the message. But it's just gossiping, meaning that I'm sure that some people in the network receive the message if the uh, sender is honest, but if the sender is dishonest, he can, uh, can equivocate and attack. That's why we need an actual consensus on top of this step, which we only agree on the root of the Merkle tree, which is a much smaller data comparing the whole uh, block. So we only run the consensus for the root of the Merkle tree. And in this way, uh, we have a gossip time of only uh, three seconds instead of 12 seconds. That's why we have uh, reduced the um, latency. So now we talked about the one good thing of blockchain is that it lets nodes to join and leave. Now, and because of that, we need the committees to be also handle the join and leave. And we need to make sure that uh, we can add nodes to the committee and remove nodes from the committees and the shards are like adaptive to the adversary. Uh, adversarial moves. So we use the QCO rule uh, to make sure we can handle chair. But the QCO, the, what the QCO rule means is that it's a, it has a very nice name. I really like the name. So it means that when you have a shard of multiple nodes, if one new node join the shard, then uh, you have to remove a constant number of nodes from that, that shard and distribute them among multiple shards. In this way, you minimize the effect of the adversary over your shards. So the adversary cannot take control over a shard by introducing new nodes to the shard. It's always randomized. You re-randomize the shard in each step. But at the same time, you don't re-randomize the whole shard at the same time. It's very important because if you, if I choose all my shards, again at random, then nobody has the state. So I want to make sure that I have enough old nodes in my shard, but also introduce new nodes to the shard. But at the same time, not all the new nodes are introduced by the adversary. This QCO rule helped me to manage that problem. And um, it's used in distributed hash tables before, but the way that they used it wasn't enough good enough uh, for uh, for the blockchain, and we changed it uh, to match the blockchain uh, requirements. How we changed it is that now we uh, introduce a notion of alive shards and uh, not alive shards. So only the shards that have a lot of no a lot of nodes in them uh, can accept a new node because every time you add a new node to a shard, you remove a constant number. Like you add one, you remove three. So a shard that accepts a new node essentially have a smaller node at the end of this phase. So that is why we start with the shards who have higher number in them. So make sure that the load is balanced between the shard and we can maintain a good load balancing property. So uh, we have the prototype of the rapid chain in Go and the, uh, we assume in this prototype that the link latency is around 100 millisecond and the node bandwidth is of uh, 20 uh, megabyte per second and we assume that there is a uh, two megabyte blocks and uh, we also um, uh, simulate the adversary, meaning that we had as we assume that 50% of the leaders of the block makers are uh, uh, corrupted and they are 
uh, equivocate in the iteration. And we assume one third of the nodes in the P2P network just remain silent and then don't pass the uh, uh, messages. So to see what our protocol really leave in the adversarial setting. So um, this is the throughput of the uh, system. So, and as you can see, when you have larger number of nodes, your throughput is going higher and it's going to be linear higher. And for a large number of nodes, which is uh, 4,000, we can achieve uh, 7,000, more than 7,000 um, uh, transaction per second. And for comparison, Bitcoin throughput is seven. So we have 1,000 order of magnitude higher, higher transaction rate. So, and to, uh, to kind of look at the latency, the latency is going to be uh, kind of the same uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the increasing the number of nodes, and you don't see a huge spike in the latency of the network. So, and it's another good experiment that we run is to see the impact of the block size. So, if you have a larger block size, usually people think if they have a larger block size, they get better throughput. But it's not correct. In Bitcoin, even if you have larger block size, you cannot increase your throughput unboundedly. Uh, but uh, it's, there is always a fine grain tune between uh, a block size in terms of getting higher throughput and the latency that your end user is seeing. So it's very important to choose the block size in a way that you don't spike the latency too much. That is why we choose a block size of to make. As you see, we have a high, very high throughput in that range and very, still very low latency. So where do we stand? So I like to do a comparison with other sharding based uh, protocol. So Elastico was the first um, that introduced the sharding in academic area, and they have the shard size of 100, and they only had the uh, shard of uh, a co uh, a computation and storage. They didn't have the communication sharding, and their time to failure was so much because they choose the shard size to be very small uh, based on their parameters. It's very important to choose the shard size very, uh, like the, the size of the shard is very important for the time to failure. Then after that, Omni Ledger tried to improve the Elastico. They have a, a good time to failure, so because they had a 600 shards, uh, but they also only had a sharding of um, storage and um, computation. They didn't have the communication sharding. That is why they couldn't go to the huge number of nodes uh, with high throughput. So it's like the limitation shows itself because each, each message should touch each node in the system. And then in comparison, rapid chain can grow up to uh, 4,000 nodes. And uh, we have the uh, like uh, throughput, which is kind of double of the uh, Omni Ledger. And uh, we kind of assume to have a, a small storage, one over 16. And uh, it's, um, we, we can say we never fail. So the failure is uh, very long. So thank you for your time. And this is the presentation. It's from a CCS paper, which will be also represented in CCS. The paper is available on archive, and you can read it. And uh, thank you so much. And I add one sentence for definitive, you are hiring. Uh, and uh, this is the references that I used in my um, talk.